Martins could not come for personal reasons, so that's why I'm here. I'm not Peter, as all of you know. So too bad he couldn't come. But anyway, it's a pleasure to share with you this, uh, this research on, on this topic that actually started through a collaboration with John Bush from MIT that visited here for sabbatical year 2012. And Paul came along and jumped into this problem. And I must say, we're having a lot of fun. At least I'm speaking for myself. I think Paul is also having a lot of fun. And as you'll see, this problem, I'm going to start showing you some videos, which, which are very pretty, are from John's group and from Yves Coudert's group from Paris. Yves is actually the father of this problem. He discovered this object. And it's a problem that we're doing a lot of math modeling, simulations, and so on. And it's a problem, I think, from the mathematical theoretical point of view. As you will see, there are much more questions than answers, but there's a lot of evidence that things, very much, very interesting things can be done. So let me start telling you the story. So I'll make sense of all of this. So this is a problem that's connected, as discovered by Yves Couder in Paris 7. It's a problem that connects, as you will see, with the wave-particle duality. It's a theme that will have some connection. So John calls it a hydrodynamic quantum analog. It has many interesting things related to to quantum dynamics. So we're looking at an object, just to show you how fun it is, we're looking to an object never studied before, for sure in fluid dynamics, in classical mechanics, and that is ne was never imagined to exist in classical mechanics. So it's an object that has properties at the same time, both properties as a wave and as a particle. And in a recent paper with Paul, John, and Carlos, who's now as a postdoc with Paul at Bath, we, have, we start with the first set of differential equations for both objects talking to each other, the particle, namely the droplet, and the wave. And our system of PDEs captures where, very well things that are seen in the lab. And it's great that we have John Bush at MIT in the math department with the fluids lab doing experiments. So, so, it's, so it's basically we have the first time formulated a PDE system for the generation and propagation of this pilot wave, which I'll show you what it is. And we can compare with laboratory experiments. And as I said, it's a problem with a great potential and need for lots and further uh, uh, mathematical contributions. So let's get to business. I'm going to start you showing some videos which sets the intuition for the mathematical modeling. But they're very beautiful, too. And I can say that because, I mean, they're not mine. They're from John Bush and, and Yves Couder. The first one is an interview by John Bush. So that's why I have the speaker at Discovery Channel. So it's just water on water, a little droplet of water, filmed, videoed with a 10,000 frame camera. So it's very fast. And it has its audio, so it will explain. So pay attention to the time scale of the little, may I call it, dancing droplet. And I'll, I, and because this will be very important for what comes later on. And just uh, an object hitting a water surface is very complex. And one sees it higher and higher levels of complexity with faster and faster cameras. The goal here is to see something that no one has ever seen before. And what Bush sees is astonishing. Water doesn't do what we think it does. When you pour water into water, the last droplets do a very quick but amazing dance. It's invisible in human time, but we can see it here. Scientists call this phenomenon the coalescence cascade. You take a drop of water, you can place it on a water bath, you ask a thousand people, and 999 will say it simply goes like this. It basically merges with the underlying bath. So if you put this droplet of water near water, you know, it doesn't merge. It generates this coalescence cascade. And very important in this video, which is very good, is you see the little droplet sits on the surface of the water before coalescing. And then it shoots another droplet at surface tension and so on. Now let me show you the second video. This is water. The second one, for reasons I will explain, is basically silicon oil, because it has good surface tension properties, good uh, viscosity properties, and some very interesting things will appear. The next video is by John Bush's group. It's something that was already discovered by Walker in 1978. And then the, the other video is Yves Couder's discovery, and you'll see the impact of all this. So this one, now, this is not a video loop. This is a droplet of silicon oil <clears throat> on a bath of silicon oil, and the droplet levitates, bounces, 
forever. How can that be? It can be because the, 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 the bath is oscillating. So basically you have a recipient of fluid which is shaken, say, 50 to 80 hertz. So it's vibrating so fast that there's no time for the air in between that little drop that, that sits on the surface that you saw before, the air to drain. So it, it bounces on the same fluid. It gets a kick through this tiny air layer. And as you increase one parameter that you will see, which is the acceleration of this periodic forcing, this droplet goes through period doubling, and it jumps high enough, which is not much, but enough. So you get two cycles of the, of the container shaking, and then it gets a kick again. And then you increase a little bit the, this parameter that you'll see of the acceleration of, of gravity, as we will model it, because we're going to put ourselves on the, on the frame of the, of the container, something spectacular happens, which is what Yves Couder discovered. And let me show you the video that talks for itself. There's a bifurcation. There's an instability that takes place as you increase the parameter a little bit. And instead of bouncing, the droplet walks on the surface of the same fluid. It basically surfs the wave field that it generates. So this, then, is the pilot wave, is the wave field that guides the droplet, that's generated by the droplet. So they have to live together. And this is the droplet basically levitating but surfing. It destabilizes it, and it, and it surfs. It, it's guided by this, this particle. So very beautiful. This was discovered by Yves Couder. This is a little bit of a side view of what would be done in the laboratory. There's this little shallow region here, here to avoid the meniscus and reflection of waves on the boundary. And this droplet can move here. So then Yves Couder. There is an external periodic forcing, which the frequency, you can think of it, it's the 80 hertz, will not change for the rest of the talk. There's just one parameter, which is, you're going to see we're going to write gravity as gravity as a, a function of time will be g times 1 plus capital gamma sine of omega t. The omega is this shaking. I won't change. But the, the parameter in front of the sign, which is the strength of this acceleration, is the parameter that generates the bifurcation and so on, Okay, so of the forcing. OK, so here's the drop that then walking on the surface of the fluid. OK, the underlying mechanism for all this is Faraday waves, which was known since long ago. Faraday was the one who proposed it. The ma first math theory to explain the instability related to this shaking of this container. And there's a threshold where standing waves appear. For the droplet, we're always below the stability threshold. So basically, the droplet triggers the, the, the unstable modes with below the threshold. But the mechanism of the wave are these standing waves, these Faraday waves. And the stability analysis was known since 54. Without the drop, it leads to Matthew's equation and so on and so on. OK, so I'm going to be, I mean, give you just an overview of all this because of the half an hour I have. Then, OK, so here's in real time in Yves Couder's lab in, in Paris, the little drop that's something you can see. It's very small, a few millimeters, but you can see here's the wave field about the droplet guiding the, 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 the wave guiding the droplet. And the name pilot wave goes back to Louis de Broglie, who uh, gave this name, coined this name, quantum mechanics, and won Nobel Prize in, in, the, in the late 20s. OK, so Yves Couder gave this nice talk at Oxford. <clears throat> the Benjamin Brook talk, very distinguished talk in fluid dynamics. Here's Eve in his lab. And actually, here are the things he mentions in his abstract, which are very, makes, very interesting. So he says, wave particle duality is a quantum behavior usually assumed to have no counterpart in classical mechanics, as I said. Let's jump a little down here. It says, surprisingly, the quantum-like behavior emerges. For example, uncertainty in a certain form, as I will show you in many forms. And there's a path memory. So this, this droplet, guided by its pilot wave, has memory of previous bounces. So, and that's very important. And uh, there's a relation of this experiment that he's done with pilot waves, as I mentioned, with models proposed by De Broglie and by Baum for quantum mechanics. And if could there be a physicist said, hey, I have this, well, I imagine that he said, hey, let's, let's, let's put this object go through a single slit and a double slit, just like Young's experiment. So he did this in this physical review letters 2006, so that's not that long ago. The droplet goes through 
a single slit. This is a submerged barrier, again, to avoid meniscus. And the angle at which it comes out is highly unpredictable. OK? And here's a little bit of a, a, a experimental, say, PDF bar chart he does and compares with the diffraction pattern that appears for single slit and so on. John's group has a lot of very good people doing experiments. They, they understood how to actually remove the sort of random forcing, even though it's not well understood. Exactly, but basically, they had to put a lid and do many things with the vibrator and so on, so they could make the trajectories be deterministic. So it's, but that's good news. The, the system is very sensitive. Then Eve did the double slit experiment. And I'll show you the videos. The videos in gray I usually buy in, done in Paris. The videos in blue are MIT. And you will see that this, this object, because it has this guide, uh, the pilot wave almost has almost like a sonar. It knows where the boundary is. It basically, as the name says, the pilot wave guides the droplet through the, the slits. So let's see now the video for the double slit. And you see the droplet never hits the boundary. It finds its, its, its way through. But the angle that it comes out is highly unpredictable. And also you see that the wave goes through both slits and generates, we cannot see here, but generates the interference pattern be, behind. And sort of things become kind of intuitive, what, what's going on. Many things are yet not understood, but intuition is being built through experiment. Well, we, we know that the wave goes through uh, 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 diffraction here, right? Goes through the both planes and refraction turning and so on. There's an interference. Now, for example, in, in John's, John's lab and, 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 uh, and people are doing models. Paul has been working on this and, and, and going the direction of understanding how does this guy, for example, just interferes with just a plane barrier. And it's very complicated. So for example, you know that for a, a ball, like the angle of incidence and so on, for waves, the same thing. This combined object, the reflection process on just a submerged barrier is very complicated. It's very complicated. So here, I mean, if I understood your question, is if you isolate things, like just the wave diffraction, that's understood, right, thrown through the slits. But exactly what's happening, what makes these angles People who have done experience. In your recent paper with Matt, you, did you do it, Paul, through uh, reflection? No. We've done models of, of reflection at the walls. So at the walls. How, how the Luis has a paper. I mean, it's understood in the sense that the right deep wave comes out, right? So but which angle comes out now? Is a lot more coming. So again, as I said, it's like the modeling is, is advancing. The theory has to follow. So therefore, there are more questions than answers from the mathematical point of view, right? From the differential equations point of view. So it depends if you see this as a fluid dynamicist or as a non-fluid dynamicist. But as a non-fluid dynamicist, yes, it's understood. That one can make up some So, uh, so then, how did the, 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 the sort of a little bit the mathematical theory start with the, particularly the Paris group and the MIT group? They started with ODEs just for the droplet to so, sort of predict the speed of the droplet, try to understand, do uh, bifurcation diagrams and so on. And this is a busy slide, but there's, there's not, uh, let me guide you through it. So here are the preliminary papers on the ODEs, writing an ODE, and basically this is an ODE for the trajectory, the, the, the projection on the plane, the trajectory of the, of the, the droplet. And basically, this is, is, a, is a, 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 like Newton's law, the acceleration. This is some friction when the droplet skids on, on the surface. And this is where the wave, H is the wave profile that soon will change to eta. And, and the forcing, and here's a coefficient that depends on surface tension. There are several models, like a trampoline model, just like a linear spring throwing the droplet up due to surface tension. These models have evolved and so on. So people started studying the dynamics through this OD, OK? And with different terms here and so on. And eventually, in, in, in our paper, we decided, oh yeah, I was almost going to fight. So the, the, the wave profile in, these, in this work basically was put by hand. So H is the wave profile. It's all the previous bounces where the wave is modeled as a Bessel function, this axisymmetric wave, no boundaries, and so on. And you start adding Bessel functions as this guy bounces. 
and there's a decay term in time and so on. But this, this you're putting the waves by hand. And we wanted the waves to be generated by the dynamics. So this is the, the step in our paper <clears throat> in the work of Carlos, which is not to put the wave here by, by hand, but to put a PDE that generates the waves so that we can put boundaries and so on. So let me skip this slide and show you the equations from, from this paper that we, we got last year, which we use the equations from, that was developed basically from John's group, where here is horizontal dynamics. They also suggest that we should add a vertical dynamic, so then you can track the droplet on the plane and also as it jumps. And we then connected this with this wave equation. And, and, and it, the, the equation doesn't show explicitly how complicated the dynamics is in, due to the feedback between the two objects. So this, this pressure term shows us the presence of the droplet. As we saw, the droplet never touches the, the, the fluid. So we, we basically model the droplet just as a pressure term generating waves. And here in this equation, we see the wave that I changed from H to eta guiding the droplet. And this is the system that we solve in the computer. And we realize it's a simplified version. We start from Navier-Stokes. We start simplifying things. We come, uh, come down to this equation. We test it on the computer. We see that the dynamics follows pretty much close to what one sees um, in the lab. But um, due to, the, to my, my, my time constraints, I'm going very fast in this introduction. But I want to show something that has an appeal in particular to, with uncertainty to probability. And this, I'll show you now a video from an experiment from uh, John Bush's group, which they are revisiting. It's not that easy to always get the result I'm going to show you, but they've been reproducing it again, which is the following. <clears throat> they put the droplet in a highly confined uh, domain. So this is a corral. It's shallow here. The droplet does not like to go into the shallow region. And see, it's zipping around. It's changing its speed in this case. This is a strobed video. That's why you don't see it jumping. You just see it at a given height. OK? And not, now what, what they're going to do, this is a joint paper by the Paris and MIT group. And then Harris is great in the lab. Now is at the math department at um, uh, North, uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So what Dan is going to do is he's going to get the video of this guy zipping around the corral. And he's going to color code this disordered trajectory here according to the speed. Okay, so this experiment takes 20 minutes. This is really an experiment. You don't see the droplet anymore. You don't see the waves. You just see the position. And it's doing like this random-like uh, trajectory, color-coded by the speed. And this takes like 20 minutes in the lab. <clears throat> and at the end, you have something, this colored spaghetti, that at the end, some rings kind of appear. Here we can see the rings that well. In the paper, in the smaller figure, we can see the rings, which means since the speed blue is slow, it means where the droplet was at a slow speed, it's more likely to be found, because it was a slow speed. And here are the sort of what I could even call conjectures, so things that we start to see but we cannot explain theoretical, so theoretically, is that when they post-process from the speed a sort of experimental uh, rendered PDF like for the position of the droplet, you see this ring shaped function that resembles very much the most unstable mode of the cavity that goes back to Matthew's equation, that 1954 paper for the Faraday waves. So here is, is, is a question how, when in the dynamics, the hard dynamics, that things like that ap appear? I mean, that, 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 that uh, this, the, the more likely positions of, the, of finding the particle are related to some of, uh, un, uh, eigenfunction or the most unstable mode of, of the Faraday uh, um, picture. And here's, and here's something that you can read in the language of this audience, slightly different from what they say in this paper. Look what they say. For a trajectory of sufficient length, coherent, wave-like statistical pattern emerges and which is connected to the cavity's most unstable Faraday mode. So it's a little bit like a, almost like some experimental ergodicity. You wait long enough, and you see this guy emerging. How can that be captured, found, theoretically? Right? So, OK. So along these lines, <clears throat> this started during my visit in Bath, 
with, with Paul, hopefully a paper of ours that has been resubmitted will be accepted. I think it will, but we'll, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, and I was going to mention Schrodinger equation in just a little while. So, <clears throat> so then, um, I we got this the, the the model from this from this paper reduced it to one D, and in one D, which means two D fluids but one D dynamics, I can model this in a in a in a domain that looks very much like the experimental one, because for most of my uh, academic life I've been working with water waves over topography. And when you have a 2D topography, you can conform a map. So basically, you can map this, this domain onto a flat strip. Onto this flat strip, as Paul said, we're trying to solve Laplace's equation in here. We have a Neumann condition here. We have a Dirichlet condition here. And we want to simplify the dynamics, removing analytically the, the depth. Basically, all we need to do is to compute this vertical velocity is use a Dirichlet to Neumann operator, which is easy to do here. We map back, and then we can do the dynamics in 1D, so it will be a, a bouncing cylinder rather than, than a, 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 a sphere, <clears throat> for a highly confined domain. And let me show you in the minutes that I have what happens. So for a very small domain, so this is time. So for a very small domain, this is basically two Faraday wavelengths apart, I, I put the droplet and it starts, it goes to the center and oscillates. OK? Oh, I went a little, oh, here it is. Yeah, so as, as Enrique was asking me how do I, parameters I'm shaking, this is the frequency that I'm shaking. The way we model is that the gravity oscillates, so in the frame of the, of the, the container. So here, this is the acceleration that I was mentioning, the acceleration parameter the, of the forcing parameter. I change it a little bit. If it's, if, if it's a little smaller, it oscillates and goes to a bouncing state. right? So here, this is time. It's just bouncing. Here, it's walking, but it's oscillating. And it looks a little bit like a, just a harmonic oscillator, a harmonic oscillator uh, controlled by the, by the guiding wave that's sloshing. I'll try to come back to this at the very end. I've got to be careful with time. I want to at least show you the uh, landscape vi vision of all this. Yves Couder has also this paper, which is very nice. Look at the drop. It, it visit, it's, it's, it's confined by this submerged frame. It's trying to escape. It can't. It goes around. This is a very fortunate video, because it goes back, revisits the same spot. And suddenly, something happens, not well understood. It escapes. So it's a bit like a tunneling effect. So they have this paper studying tunneling. So we ask, will our reduced model handle this? We already seen that it has the bifurcation mechanism and so on in all the other paper. So in the, with this 1D model, then I can do two cavities. The conformal mapping is, 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 is well tailored for how many cavities I want to do with this, with this barrier. And suddenly, you see that the droplet who's in this cavity here es escapes, goes to the other one. Here it escapes back. And again, all this is evidence of the dynamics, but no theory, not well understood. And as in the paper by Yves Couder, we change a little bit certain parameters. For example, the, the width of the obstacle, the pattern at which this droplet is tunneling, jumping from one cavity to the other, the time of residence in each cavity changes completely. Okay, so, uh, so many things to understand. Then according to the paper, so this is the paper that hopefully to appear in action 17. <clears throat> As in the paper by Kuder, if we look at the, the, the tunneling probability is the number of events divided by attempts. So this, for example, are a few attempts, and it was not succeeded. We see also that the probability decre decreases quite a bit just by changing the barrier width by just a little bit. Change a little bit, so we do this, uh, this chart, and you, you see that uh, by changing the barrier width by just a little bit, the probability of tunneling uh, decreases. But it's a little bit like, like one sees uh, uh, in other scenarios. And we keep on exploring. There's a lot to explore. Actually, as, as we go along and, and one, we start acquiring some intuition for some of the questions without a theoretical answer, many other questions arise. So here is one thing that's also interesting and puzzling, trying to look for, for what John said, saw in that corral. With this 1D and this part model might be a little oversimplified. I can explain to those interested here. I don't have 
time. But still look what happens. I did several simulations, putting the droplet in one cavity and letting it go, just like you saw here. Okay? And here are many different patterns. Okay? And here with a barrier. So, and then I do a bar chart for where is the most likely place to find the droplet. So one realization would be this one with the arrow. It happened to, even though it started in this other cavity, cavity two, it stayed more time in cavity one. And the blue bar chart is the bar chart for where the cavity, the, the droplet stayed most of the time in this simulation, which I did for 5,000 um, Faraday periods related to the forcing. And then playing around, it takes me a lot of time to get some of these graphs because I have no theory. It's basically following my nose, my intuition. Sometimes it works interesting, sometimes it doesn't. But then look what happened. We do, we do these simulations and these sort of 12 simulations of this, I think. Yeah, 12 simulations of this and average them and you get the black line as the bar chart. And then I did one realization which was five times longer, 25K, and it falls right on top, right? So there, it, what's going on? And, and, the, and the question is still, this, 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 uh, this uh, bar chart yet doesn't look like the structure of the most unstable mode of the cavity, which here, as Paul said, the, the eigenfunction for the Laplacian in 1D would be just a sinusoidal profile. We're not seeing that. Here, this model is more simplified than the other one I showed you in 2D because it doesn't have vertical dynamics. It has only horizontal dynamics. So the, the forcing of the, dro the droplet that has a force is prescribed because I tell the droplet, basically I'm telling the droplet when it has to jump. When you have vertical dynamics, the droplet jumps when it wants to jump. So it, 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 it's free to jump. So that might be important to get a more interesting thing, but a uh, 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 bar chart. But anyway, I want to exhaust the limits of, of the more reduced model to see what it gives me and what it doesn't. And I'm almost finishing. So look at, look at a very simple problem that I, I, I have mentioned about this a few times in talks, and I don't know, haven't been given references. Maybe some of you might know. It's a simple problem that I think can be posed from this problem, which is from this model, we see that the wave, and you see from this sort of oscillator-like profile, that the wave is kind of somehow playing the role of a potential, right? The potential for this droplet. But here, it's a little slightly more complicated potential because it's a time-dependent potential, and you see this wave sloshing a little bit that sort of makes the, this, this, the droplet do the, the oscillator. So basically, I could write this like that, right? And questions arise, at least in my mind, which is, well, this potential here was associated to this wave equation. This potential could be associated to other waves, could have other dynamics. And when is it interesting, or things will be interesting enough, that this potential will lead to, uh, 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 say, uh, an, an underlying probabilistic uh, statistical picture of this that is interesting, connected to most unstable modes, who knows, connected even to the Schrodinger equation from the probabilistic point of view. Not understood, even with, say, simplified toy models. So looking at this as, as an oscillator, very recently, <clears throat> while I was finishing my visit at MIT, one of John's students eventually did some experiments with this guy in a more or less one, one, one like, uh, almost like 1D uh, uh, domain. And it was interesting to see. So this is the droplet. We cannot see the wave. And we can see actually the droplet here not reaching the boundaries, just like you see as predicted from the 1D model. So basically, what's preventing it from going to the bias, there's not much room for the wave to slosh. And basically, the wave is doing something similar to this. And then just one, I think, more thing before I finish of all these, these questions of things that are not fully understood is that also playing with the simulations, look what happens here. Here, the barrier is very high. The depth is very low. And you see this oscillation here. The droplet never escapes from this cavity. Nevertheless, a little bit of wave energy moves on to the other side. And one thing that I didn't mention clear, I'm sorry, is that we're always operating here below the Faraday threshold. 
which means if there's no droplet, I didn't say this clearly, sorry, if there's no droplet and we shake the container, nothing happens. But as soon as you put the droplet, it triggers, even though you're below the threshold, the, 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 the underlying mode. So if you're close enough to, to, to the threshold, basically a little bit of wave energy going to the other cavity, you see a little bit of wave activity staying there um, um, due to the shaking. Now, when I lower this just by a little bit, look what happens. The droplet still does not leave this cavity, but the dynamics in the nearby cavity is affecting. See, it's not, it's not there's, there's more Fourier modes in this periodic profile that we, you, that we had before. So there's really some non-local uh, dynamics taking place. Okay, and I think now is my last slide, is that then Miles Couchman doing the experiments at MIT, he then put, uh, in this period he put three, because I've done this simulation with three, three uh, uh, cavities, so he did a simulation with two cavities, three, sorry, cavities. There's a droplet here, there's a droplet there, and he, he, he let these guys go. I think this is gonna be my last slide. They're oscillating, so it's, they're oscillating. We cannot see the waves. And what Miles sees in the experiment is this, that at some point, this droplet here died. It just coalesced and disappeared. And what was amazing that he saw is that when this droplet was present, it's this blue profile. You have basically a, a, a main mode for the, for the oscillation of this guy, and there was the secondary mode due to this cavity far away. And when it died, it went to the red mode. So basically, there is some correlation at a distance to some extent. This is very preliminary, not to be said any further, because as I said, here there's more questions than answers and, and things to be further understood. So uh, with this experiment that uh, was still, as you see, the, the, the filming is very preliminary and, and, and not sophisticated as before. Well, anyway, so here, to conclude, um, We've been successful with the uh, with generation and propagation, which is this paper, which is a much more sophisticated model. And now the questions are more on these confined domains, 1D, tunneling, other things to be understood, adding disorder on purpose to, 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 this, model, to, this, to this model, identification of wave function-like scenarios. John, with his postdocs, are actually revisiting that corral experiment, and they have a, 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 an elliptical domain where sometimes they're able to see that the uh, uh, sort of their experimental PDF bar chart looks like one of the uh, eigenmodes of the e e elliptical cavity and so on. Anyways, and there's this annual review by, by John that explains a little bit the history of the problem up to 2015. And thank you very much for your attention. Sorry I went a few minutes uh, uh, beyond. <laughs>